Well, good evening, friends. I hope that uh, you're doing well. This is a uh, very good week for me. I am uh, at a house on the Outer Banks up in Kerala with uh, friends John and Debbie Duba and some of their family. Their two daughters are here and six of their grandchildren are here. <clears throat> Some of you will remember that we have, uh, you've been praying for John. He was in the hospital for a number of weeks. He is out. Uh, he's uh, moving a little bit slower than normal, but he's getting around. And they had uh, rented this house, planning on having a big family reunion for their 50th wedding anniversary. And, of course, with COVID, many of the folks could not come, but the house was paid for. <clears throat> And we were invited to come over and share a few days with them. So we are broadcasting tonight from Kerala in the Outer Banks, and I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, I think John will be down. I'm on the second floor of the house. I think John will be down a little while, and I'll say thank you also for the prayers you've had for him. Uh, we've also been praying for Li and Yang, our Chinese couple. Who is, he is a church leader and minister in Kunming, China. And they had a little girl about three weeks ago, Li Lu Ming. And when I can figure out how to do this, I will post a picture of her. She is a beautiful little girl. And I will do my best to somehow post it on the Rosemary Facebook page. So, uh, with that introduction, uh, we'll go on with our story, our class. We're in the Book of Judges, and we're at Chapter 4. If you have a Bible, you might want to turn there. And I will remind you, kind of as introduction, that <clears throat> the period of judges for the nation of Israel was a period of chaos and confusion, of loving God and going away from God, and loving God and going away from God. And it was a time that was really terrible. The last, uh, the last verse of the book of Judges says this, In those days Israel had no king. And everyone did as he saw fit. The King James said, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And doesn't that sound a lot like today? People simply doing whatever they feel like doing, saying, I have a right to do this, whether it interferes with anybody else's rights or not. Uh, it's a very, uh, very chaotic situation. Still, during this whole period, there are always people who were faithful to God, that faithful remnant, if you will. Well, by the time we get to about the end of the book of Judges, the next book in the Bible is called Ruth, but that actually occurs in the same time period as the, as the Judges. And we find uh, Naomi and her husband and their sons being faithful to God. We find Boaz as a faithful servant of God. And they're all living in the time of Samuel, the last of the Judges of Israel. And as we begin chapter 4, we read about another individual who is a faithful servant of God. And her name is Deborah. And before we look at the text, I don't know about you, but when I, as a young person, when I was taught from the book of Judges or when we read these stories, you know, they seemed almost like, uh, oh, like episodes of The Lone Ranger or Rawhide or, or one of those TV shows where some, you know, one person rises up and they come in and they fix whatever is broken in that show and then they kind of ride off into the sunset. And while I understood this actually happened, it just had no real bearing on my own life. There was nothing there in particular for me to think about. And so uh, I think we live, as I said, in a time that is very similar to the period of the Judges and uh, where there is a chaos going on in our culture and in the world. But there is always that faithful remnant, people who are faithful to God. And by that, I don't mean necessarily it's the church as a whole. The church also is infiltrated with the things of this world. But within God's people, there is always a faithful remnant who will honor him, who will worship him, and who will attempt to live by the things that he teaches us and tells us about. That does not mean, I want to qualify this a little bit, that does not mean that it's only the faithful remnant is people who um, 
have never changed anything in 50 or 100 years. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is people whose desire, heart's desire, is to hear what God has to say and apply it in their own life and time in the way that makes a difference for the cause of Christ. And so tonight as we look at Judges, we're going to look at the first few verses, if you'd like to read along with me. And in this setting, we're going to find uh, an interesting thing happening. Uh, in verses 1 through 3, it says, After Ehud died, remember Ehud is the one who killed uh, King Eglon of Moab, after Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoyim. I'm not going to try and say that a second time. Okay, because he had 900 iron chariots, and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. So listen to what happened here. Think about this. Ehud leads them, and in his lifetime, for about 40 years or 80 years, the land had peace. But once he dies, and the people revert to, say, doing whatever is right, each person doing whatever is right in their own eyes, God gives the people discipline. And the discipline is a form of, of uh, oppression. It's a form of persecution. This king rises up, uh, this king Jabin, and he is a Canaanite, and he oppresses the people. And the man that he uses, this man Sisera, is a cruel commander of the army. So it's probably, from the research I've done, it's a lot like having a... Oh, sorry, I just had brain war. Having an army that lives in your own country and tells you what to do. Similarly, occupying army. It's an occupation situation. The Canaanites move back into the land. They have their army posts everywhere. And if you get out of line, you're, you're going to be hurt. And so they're living under this, it says, for 20 years. And they cry out to the Lord for help. Notice that when God's people are oppressed, in the Old Testament in particular, when God's people are oppressed, it's because God is trying to get their attention. It is not just because that other nation is evil, or the king is evil, or he has a bigger army, but God allows these things to happen, brings them about to happen, in order to discipline his own people. And so one of the questions that I'm wrestling with right now in my own life, and my own thinking, private time and ministry, is all the things that are going on in our own culture that we think are terrible, and they are, many of them, is this God at work to bring me a message, to bring us a message, to help us to know how to stand for what we believe in, and how to deal with the world that's around us? I don't have an answer to that. I don't know the mind of God. He hasn't revealed any of those things to me. But it is worth considering that the things that we have always taken for granted that seem to be being taken away from us or moving in the wrong direction, is that happening because God wants to get our attention as his people? Now, I don't, again, I don't know the answer. But in this case, in verse beginning of verse 4 of chapter 4, we find here's what God has chosen to do. Verse 4, chapter 4. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. Now, this is at the time when, when after 20 years, they're crying out to the Lord for help. It says she held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes settled. She sent, and then she goes on and sends for Barak, but I want to stop right there. Deborah is a very unique individual. First of all, we're used to having men as judges in this book, and here's this woman that God has raised up. And she didn't raise herself up. She's not the commander of an army. She doesn't say, I've had enough, and gets out her sword and bites. 
but she is already established. She is a prophetess. A prophetess is a spokesperson for God, just like all the prophets were. And she holds court. She settles disputes. She is a recognized leader of the people of Israel. And she does this as a judge sitting under this palm tree, or palm of Deborah, wherever that is. But in a world of chaos, where a woman was still mostly considered to be property, both by the Jews and Gentiles, a world in which her world is filled with a strong patriarchal system, where the men are in charge of everything, God does this unusual thing. He says, I choose you to be a judge, to be a leader, and to proclaim my word, to be a prophetess. And so, here's Deborah. So she does what God tells her. In beginning of verse 6, it says, She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh, and Naphtali. Naphtali is the tribe. And said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go and take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulon and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his char chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. So Deborah calls Barak and he comes to her apparently. And he says, she says, look, this is from God. The Lord God of Israel commands you to do this. And what does Barak say? Barak, Barak. Barak said to her, verse 8, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Where is Barak's faith? Where is Barak's faith? She's a prophetess. She's recognized. She has authority to speak to him. And she says, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you and what does he say back? Well, I'll go if you'll go along and hold my hand. Now, that's Ship's paraphrased version, obviously. But there's a serious lack of faith on Barak's part. And Deborah, of course, will agree to go. <clears throat> but she warns him. She says in verse 9, very well, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now, we kind of know, I think we all know the rest of the story. Uh, they, rout, they rout Sisera and his army. Sisera escapes on foot, and he goes to a tent, where the people, the tribe that lived in that area were friends with him, with the king, with Jabin. And they were descendants of Moses' father-in-law. They were like, I don't know how many generations down, but they would have been like third or fourth or fifth cousins away from Moses and his family. But they descended from that same family. And Sisera hides in the tent of a woman named Jaal. We, I always pronounce it Jael. J-A-E-L, jail, as a uh, child, but it's really jail. And she gives him some milk to drink, and he falls asleep, and she takes a big tent peg and a hammer and drives it through his head into the ground, right through his temple. And of course then, she is the one that's credited with the victory. And they don't know what to do with that either when it's all over. But all of that, all of that to say, uh, I think Deborah deserves a second look. And I'm going to ask John to come on in the room and uh, talk with you a minute. He wanted to say thank you for your prayers. And then we'll come back and talk about Deborah again. There you go. You can sit over there. Hello, everybody there, Rosemary. I wanted to thank each of you for all the gracious prayers that you entered up in my name. Um, hospital visit was about a month. I had three weeks, uh, part of it in surgery, then a little over a week in rehab. And um, I'm sure that I recovered as well as I did because of your great support. 
I miss all of you. I'm in North Carolina, but unfortunately I'm not inland. I'm sitting on the ocean. And uh, I wish all of you could be here. God Rodney, bless you. We Rodney you. has especially been asking about you, and he's watching. Rodney, thank you. I really appreciate it. One of the elders there. And, um, you know, your kind support and everything really means the world and all to me. So it's... It's always nice to know that my wife and I have a home away from home. And that would be right there in Washington, North Carolina. So God bless you. And there's the camera. <laughs> and we love you. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. I call that a little intermission from my big mouth, but that'll be fine. Okay. Great. We're talking about Deborah and... I think that this whole situation with her deserves kind of a second look from those of us that are adults and, and have been around the uh, church here for a long time. Several times, and several times in the last few weeks, this question about women in the church has come up in front of me. And it's not been a, a contentious type of question. It's been a, a real searching kind of questioning. And I don't have all the answers, obviously, and I'm not making suggestions about what somebody else should do. But here's what I do want to say. There is a, uh, I think, I think as church leadership and as mature Christians, uh, most of, most of those who follow this Wednesday night class, I think, would be in that classification as mature Christians, that we need to take a serious look again at the scripture in regard to the role of women within the church. Now, when I say within the church, I do not mean simply or only in terms of a Sunday morning assembly. That's only one thing that's the church. We are the church 24-7. Wherever we go, we are the church representing Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. So I'm asking us to take a, a prayerful look at the role of women in the body as a whole. And how do we enable everyone to become all that God intends for them to be? Um, my experience within the church is that we have been quick to quote 1 Corinthians 14, 34, which that verse, in, at least in the King James, says, let the women be silent in the church. And we have uh, chosen how to define what church means in that context. And we've used that without looking at the bigger picture of 1 Corinthians 14, where three different groups of people in the exact same language are told to be quiet. One group are prophets who are proclaiming God's word. One group are those who have the ability to speak in tongues, and one group are females who, women, perhaps wives only, the context determines that, who are being disruptive. And at the end of all of that, it says, let everything be done decently and in order. Now, I was not very old, I'm guessing young teenager, when I figured out that we didn't really understand how to use that text, we just used it. And by we, I mean the church, the family, and congregation in which I grew up. When I was a child, once a month or quarterly, the whole church had a congregational meeting. We didn't have men's meetings, we didn't have elders, we didn't have deacons. We, but about once a quarter, probably, we would have a congregational meeting usually on a Sunday afternoon, sometimes in place of the Sunday evening service. So everybody attended. The men attended, the women attended, husbands and wives, single adults, and children attended. Everybody came, just like it was a regular church service. Except there was not singing, there was not communion, uh, there were always some prayers, and then conversation and discussion of whatever the life of the church was, was going on in the life of the church at that time. My dad's oldest sister was part of that congregation, and she tended to, her personality tended to be one of control 
uh, an influence. Succinctly put, she liked being in charge. And so things got a little rowdy at one or two of these congregational meetings. And then one Sunday morning, whoever was speaking, we also did not have a full-time preacher, whoever was uh, speaking was assigned the task of saying that this verse, let women be silent in the church, included the business meetings, and from now on they would be men's business meetings. Well, that kind of solved an immediate problem, but it told me as a 13 or 14 year old, this can mean whatever we want it to mean. And that's not what God intends. And so we use a lot of different verses uh, in various ways. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, we have to use that in the context of all the rest of the chapter. The other verse that speaks directly to women within the assembly, or at least some women within the assembly, is 1 Timothy 2.11, where Paul says to Timothy, I do not, a women must learn in, in all quietness and submission. I do not allow a woman to, have, to teach or have authority over a man. Now, the context there is questionable. Does it mean man and woman, or does it mean husbands and wives? Because the word for man and husband is on air. There's only one word in Greek for both. The word for woman is gune, which can be woman or wife. It's used in both ways. Context determines it. To be honest, this is one of the most complicated passages in the New Testament. And it has to be explained. We have to decide how to use that verse and at the same time explain its relationship to verse 15, which says, but the woman will be saved through childbearing. What does that mean? How does that fit with the rest of what's there? And I can honestly tell you, if you do the research on this, you will find, I'm going to pick a number, you'll find 20 scholars who will say it means it's about husbands and wives, and you'll find 20 scholars that will say, no, it's men and women in general. How do we determine how to use that verse is very, very important. But however we decide, we have to be thoughtful and considerate of the scriptures to say it fits in this whole passage because it matches the rest of the passage in these ways. And I think that's important for our personal integrity and in doing the right, right thing before God and before man. Now, let me make a, a disclaimer here. I am not suggesting anything to upset the church. I am not suggesting changing anything. I don't have all the answers, and they would not be my answers to make, to begin with, for any one congregation. I am suggesting that we need to look at the whole of the Bible in order to come to some right conclusions about how to treat people regardless of their gender within the church. And for example, I th I'm suggesting that until we can explain these texts that I've just mentioned, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 Timothy 2, until we can explain them and include in the discussion passages like Judges 4, why did God put a woman in that role of, of authority among his people if it wasn't okay for her to do that? And did, what does that teach us about this? What about Acts chapter 2, where God says through the prophet Joel, I will pour out my spirit on all people. My sons and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will see dreams. Dream dreams. God says he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit on everyone, male and female, servant and slave, master and free person. In Acts 21, we learn about again about the evangelist Philip, who had four daughters who prophesied. How did anybody know they prophesied? They certainly didn't do it in their closet. And what did prophecy mean for them? Was it about foretelling the future primarily? Or was it the normal use of the word prophecy for proclaiming 
what God had to say. Um, the other one that's in there is 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> there are both men and women who are praying and prophesying in the assembly in an unhealthy way. They are misbehaving. This is one of John's grandsons here. This is, tell him your name. Hi. Tell him your name. What's your name? Tell him. Say it to the screen. You're going to be bashful? Okay, you go, Scoot. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says to the men and the women who are praying in public and prophesying in public to straighten up their act. He never tells them to stop praying or prophesying. He says, you're doing it simply to get attention to yourself. That's not right. And he gives instructions on how to do it properly. But he doesn't say to either one of them, don't do this. And so we have to take all of this into consideration. I believe that as a church, not just Rosemary, but our church has a fellowship that we need to be involved. Hang on just a minute. Come over here, guys. These Hi. are some more John's grandchildren. Hello. Hi. Hello, hello, hello. 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 Hi. <laughs> all right. Are you guys going to sing a song or anything? No. Okay, my then goodbye. My, my <laughs> name's Gary. Go. Go. I said my name's Gary. Okay. I believe that we need to be in prayerful, discerning conversation and avoiding what I call historical cliches, meaning taking things out of context. I think we need to prayerfully be asking God and searching the scriptures and talking with them within ourselves. How do we affirm that the part of the goal of the cross is to empower everyone to become all that God intends for them to be? Again, a disclaimer. I don't want to disrupt your con this congregation or any other congregation. What I do want is to be faithful to God's word in all of it to the very best of our ability, my personal ability and our ability. And my suggestion to us is this, that we have followed what has been taught to us in the past without rethinking it and without examining all of the scripture. This example of Deborah in her role as a judge is a powerful example of the way God sometimes, at least, has chosen to use women. It is my conviction from Galatians 3 that as far as value to the kingdom, as far as inherent uh, worth, Paul says, as many of you as been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. For in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ, and we are all heirs of the promises given to Abraham. Now, that took away a whole lot of inequity. The cross and the resurrection took away all that inequity between dip in caused by differences between people. Now, equality does not equal the same thing as everybody has the same role or everyone is ready for the same role. That's not the point. The point is this. Are we diligently seeking to empower every person, regardless of whether they're male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free, rich or poor, are we attempting to empower every person to become all that God intends for them to be? Now, Barak, in this lesson from Deborah, from Judges 4 and 5, Barak is a guy that God has chosen. And what does he say? I'm not up to it. I'm not ready for it. I'll go, but only if you go with me. I need somebody to hold my hand. I have to have help with this. And God still uses him, but he takes away the honor that Barak should have had. Barak, Barak or Barak should have been the leader of the army. Instead, who gets the credit? Deborah and Jaal. Jaal gets credit for killing Sisera, but I ask you to take the time to read chapter 5. Chapter 5 is an outstanding 
him to God about his power over the enemies of his people. And it is a, something we need to also consider compared to the way that we are being asked to deal with the world around us today. Now, I realize the church is not called on to build an army similar to the one Barak called and go out and just kill, murder, kill, destroy our enemies physically. The Sermon on the Mount certainly should be our guiding light and our guiding principles for dealing with the evil that's around us. And yet, there's something here in this chapter 5 that says there's a reason to celebrate when evil is destroyed. And how do we go about that? How do we make our lives attuned with the heart of God when he celebrates the destruction of evil? when he initiates that process. Now you say, well, God wouldn't do a thing like that. Now I want to remind you of the history of the Israelite nation. God, God, not Nebuchadnezzar, God is the one who took the Israelites into captivity. They sinned against him. He was upset with them. He is very often, he was very often uh, patient with them but when it came time for discipline God initiates it and he sends them into Babylon and he raises up Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire was bad enough but when it became fully corrupt fully evil God raised up the Medo-Persian Empire and he brings in King Cyrus the king of the Medes and the Persians and he conquers Babylon and then God says something interesting about Cyrus. Isaiah records that God says of King Cyrus, He is my Messiah. That's the word he uses. He is my anointed one to bring my people back to Judea and to rebuild the temple. God raises people up and God tears people down. He always has. I believe that he still does today. So the question is, whose side do we want to be on? Do we want to be like Deborah? Do we want to be that faithful remnant in Israel? Or do we want to be the part that's taken into captivity and suffers immensely? And then finally, when God's compassion is brought back. There's lots of folks out there, especially in TV land, who want to tell you they know exactly what God's doing. You know, God's for this person, God's against this person, God did this to these people. They may be right, but they don't know. Don't buy into those false prophets. But what we can buy into is that God calls us to faithfulness. And that faithfulness includes every person who's a part of our congregation. And sometimes God may raise up someone that we don't expect to be in a leadership, uh, high, em high emphasis, high, high uh, profile position or responsibility, and God can use them mightily, and we can be blessed through that. Now again, I'm not suggesting that we change anything. I'm not trying to stir up any kind of problem. But I do believe we owe it to God, we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our congregations to fully examine all the scripture and find the best way that we can empower every person to live out the fullness that God intends for them. And I believe that's what Deborah, for me at least, that's why the record of Deborah and this event is found in the book of Judges. It's a reminder that God can do things outside the norm. And those that work with him will go along with his program rather than our own. I hope that you are being blessed through this study. It is, uh, to me, it's very interesting uh, in the time in which we live. Next week, we'll look at chapter 6 with Gideon. Uh, we're familiar with him. Chapter 6 and 7. And uh, we'll see how God, again, raises up a, an individual and then in a most unusual way, defeats an enemy uh, on his own terms, on God's own terms. There, thank you for your patience with me tonight and with uh, 
the quote unquote interruptions from the children. I am glad that you got to see them. They are a joy. Uh, Kathy and I are blessed that they kind of count us as an extra set of grandparents. And uh, I'm happy that we're able to do this again tonight. This lesson is a little bit shorter tonight, but I kept you 53 minutes last week. And so tonight you get a little bit of a break. Let me, uh, let me pray and uh, we'll call it a, an evening together. Father God, you are powerful and wise beyond our ability to comprehend. And you do some of the most unusual things sometimes in ways that, that seem to us to be out of the ordinary or, or just not normal, not, not right. And yet you are always right. And so I am thankful to you for faithful people throughout all the history of this world. And tonight, having taken a look at Deborah and her role that you chose her for in the life of your church, of your family back there in the, the time of the judges, Father, thank you for raising up faithful men and women who are bold and courageous and will stand for what is right and will... will uh, do be used by you in very powerful ways and father we don't always see what's happening we don't always understand what's happening i certainly am um, not in understanding of the conditions in our culture right now and things that are going on but i do believe that you are in charge that you are all powerful and all loving and all wise and that if we will simply humbly seek your face you will make us into a mighty force for good in this time and place in your world. Father, thank you for that privilege. Thank you for that opportunity. And may we be men and women of faith and bravery and courage as we live in your presence each day. And I ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all and good night. And uh, I'll be back at home next Wednesday night as we continue this study. God bless.